Okay, so this study is continuing on with basically, well, it surrounds the scripture uh, about the power of the tongue. If I could find it here, I just had the thing. But the power of the tongue is that of life and death. With the fruit of a man's mouth, his stomach will be satisfied. He will be satisfied with the product of his lips. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. And Jesus even teaches on this. By your words, you will be justified. By your words, you will be condemned. For out of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man brings forth out of his heart good treasure, and a wicked man brings wicked things out of the treasure of his heart. And the tree is known by its fruit. A bad tree cannot produce good fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit. So, Ephesians teaches us that we are seated in the heavenly places when we are in Christ and he is in us, when we have his Holy Spirit. We're sealed with his Holy Spirit. We're seated with him in the heavenly places. And so, We cannot let corrupt communication at this point proceed out of our mouths. We have to speak to, to edification, rebuke, exhortation, admonition, and basically speak rightly of, of God and speak the things of God to creation. That's the Great Commission. And so... What this is saying is the old way of life, even the things that you used to speak that were corrupt, the things that the Bible teaches against, these cannot be part of our conversation anymore. And so, James in his epistle tells of how double talk or uh, being double tongued cannot be a part of the Christian's life. Dear brothers and sisters, don't all of you or all of you shouldn't be striving to become teachers in the church for we who teach will be judged more strictly or under a stricter standard of conduct. Indeed, we all make many mistakes for if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. We can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth, and a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses, even though the winds are strong. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark can set a forest on fire, and among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness, corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. And so the Lord even says, the things that you eat, the things that you drink, these don't defile a person, but what defiles a person is what comes out of their mouth, the things that are spoken from the heart. People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God, that is, people. And so, blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. Does a spring of water bubble out with both salt water and fresh water? Does a fig tree produce olives or a grapevine produce figs? No, you can't draw fresh water from a salty spring. So... When you have the Holy Spirit in you, it's as the scripture says, God has taken the stony heart out and has given you a heart of flesh that he can write his word into. And so, with the Holy Spirit in, your, in the core of your being, at this point what Jesus spoke of, how out of their bellies shall flow rivers of living water, this is now the case for those who are in Christ. And they need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. 
and the baptism of fire that is spo spoken of in the Gospels. There come, as John the Baptist said, there comes someone after me who is mightier than I, who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And so the Holy Spirit brings the gifts. The fire is something else entirely, which it's as the scripture says in Hebrews, our God is a consuming fire. It's at the end of chapter 12. And at this point, it's the Holy Spirit pretty much flowing out of that overflowing well that the person is at that point, has a, has a way of putting it. And so the power of the Holy Spirit is evident with these people. The signs are following them. So... As it says in Jeremiah, thus says the Lord in verse 5 of chapter 17, Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind and makes flesh his strength. Speaking of unsaved, corrupt flesh that does not have the Holy Spirit dwelling in it. And whose heart turns away from the Lord? For he will be like a bush in the desert, and will not see when prosperity comes, but will live in stony wastes in the wilderness, a land of salt without inhabitant. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, and whose trust is the Lord, for he will be like a tree planted by the water that extends its roots by a stream, and will not fear when the heat comes, but its leaves will be green, and it will, be not, will not be anxious in a year of drought, nor cease to yield fruit. And then... Psalm, Psalm chapter 1, so I'll go there, I could even do that with this, Psalm chapter 1. Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join in with mockers, but they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They are like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit in each season. Their leaves never, never wither. They prosper in all that they do, but not the wicked. They are like worthless chaff scattered by the wind. They will be condemned at the time of judgment. Sinners will have no place among the godly. For the Lord watches over the path of the godly, but the path of the wicked leads to destruction." And as some scriptures in the New Testament point out, there are no partial Christians in the kingdom of God. They're, the, they're pretty much lukewarm. The Lord spews them out of his mouth. That's in Revelation. And 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Any, anyone who practices those forms of wickedness will not see the kingdom of God. Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 to 26, those who practice the works of the flesh will not see the kingdom of God. At the end of the book of Revelation, where the Lord speaks of the new Jerusalem, and those who can inhabit it and those who can't outside of it are found. Those who work wickedness of every kind, the dogs, sorcerers, those who are perverted, they are are not going to be able to enter that heavenly city. And so, to live by faith, the just shall live by faith. It's those who are doers of the word that are blessed in their deed. And faith without works is dead, just as works without faith is likewise dead. This is in thought, in word, and in deed, which is why it's admonished to those who are in Christ that is strongly urged to put on the mind of Christ. And how do you do this? You get in the word of God, you diligently study it. This changes you from the inside out. It renews your mind as with the washing of water with the word of God. And so 
you also have to speak it. Your confession has to be right. And when you quote God, you're not wrong. And you have to personalize his word. Uh, just like with Deuteronomy chapter 28, he makes you the head, not the tail. He makes you up the lender unto many, many nations, never the borrower. He puts you above only, never beneath. He makes Jason Bauer the head and not the tail. He puts Jason Bauer above and not beneath. He makes Jason Bauer a lender unto many nations and never the borrower, which means he also breaks debt off my life. He blesses me with overflowing blessing in every area of my life. It chases me down. I don't have to go looking for it because I live for him and I am found the righteous in him. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He makes me more than a conqueror because I trust in him and live for him. He makes me his son in his house. I am a king's son. I am a co-heir with Christ, one of his brothers. That's what he says. Who, who are my brothers and my sisters and my mother? Those who hear the word of God and do it. And so he, he says that I have much land that he has for me, houses that I did not build that I will inhabit. I am blessed with overflowing blessing in all that I put my hand to. And this is, uh, it says in the scriptures, livestock, produce, goods, services, family. And what, even in the modern times here, he is still the same God. He blesses me with things that I like. He gives me the desires of my heart because I delight in him. And so this is, all the things that I like, uh, the musical instruments, uh, the, everything. Uh, the, uh, I'd name off some things, but they'd, uh, they wouldn't exactly be uh, politically correct. You flip a switch and they go boom, and they like take down a deer at a distance. So um, anyway, it's uh, all those things. So... So your confession has to be right, and this is even regarding your own family, even in praying for them. Lord, work in these people's lives. I've been attempting to tell them about you. I've told them about you. They still want to go their own way. They're not interested in what I have to say, Lord. Send someone who can witness to them and send people, put people in their path that will give glory to you and bear witness of you and who you are. Make yourself real to them. Lord, do a work in their hearts that they, their eyes will be open to you, their heart will be open to you when you're ministering, that they know that you are the right way to go, Lord, that they choose you and they find the life that you have for them, Lord God. Help them in this. You're the only one who can do this. You're the only one who can change people, Lord God. Tug at them. Lead them, Lord. Open the way for them to find you and to take hold of you and to proceed in your way, Lord. I ask in Jesus' mighty name. And then, after that, you can't go around and uh, start, like, slandering them to people. Well, I know he's at, he's this way, and uh, it, it's, uh, he's a stubborn fellow, I, I guess. Uh, it, it, he, he's like a... a German descent, you know the, how, how stubborn these people are, and it's like uh, uh, just going on for like family stubbornness or national stubbornness or, or, or whatever, or it's like uprooting the seed that you've just sown. And so, just as an example, but whatever the case may be, your words have to edify, and which translates to building up a holy temple to the Lord, which is what a person is. And so, that's how it has to be. Otherwise, you can't expect to actually see anything happen, because then you prove to be a double-minded man or a double-minded person who's unstable in all their ways. So, that's... what that is pointing to. And 
Zechariah chapter 8, verses 14 to 17. Speaking of his chosen people here, which the church is grafted into. For thus says the Lord of hosts, just as I determined to punish you when your fathers provoked me to wrath, says the Lord of hosts, and I would not relent. So again in these days I am determined to do good to Jerusalem, to the house of Judah. Do not fear. These are the things you shall do. Speak each man the truth to his neighbor. Give judgment in your gates for truth, justice, and peace. Let no one think evil in your heart against your neighbor. Do not love a false oath, for all these things, all these are things that I hate, says the Lord. And even Jesus, when he was being questioned by someone, it's like, uh, what are the greatest commandments? Love your heart, Lord, pff, Lord rebuke that. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And I think this also translates to the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And let none of you think evil in your heart against your neighbor. And as one of the Pharisees, wanting to justify himself, says, Who is my neighbor? And then Jesus gives the parable of the Good Samaritan, who actually was somebody who... He was of a nation that was in low standing with the Jewish people. But he saw one of those people uh, wounded at the side of a road by bandits. And so he, he picks him up, cleans his wounds, binds his wounds, takes him to a place where he'd be taken care of until he recovers enough to take care of himself. And he even paid for the cost of all that. And so... Who, who was the neighbor unto the person who had fallen by the wayside, and uh, so it was answered, well, it was the one who helped him. And there were others that passed by, one of them being of the priesthood, the religious priesthood, a Levite, and uh, so, some other person, which I don't remember, but anyway. So... Jeremiah chapter, I think it's 17, already went over that one, so Philippians chapter 4 verses 4 to 9, rejoice in the Lord always, again I say rejoice, let your gentle spirit be known to all men, the Lord is near, do not be anxious for anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good re reputation, if there's any excellence, anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The things which you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these, and the God of peace will be with you. So, this is a picture of no murmuring, no backbiting, no agenda against others, no bitterness, no no striving. They, this is a happy people, which is able to show Christ likeness, which is easily recognized. And those who delight in the Lord, God gives them abundant joy and peace. And those who delight in the Lord also have the desires of their heart. And those who delight in the Lord, these are a people who minister to others, they reach out, they minister the word of God, which is able to do all these things in the lives of those who actually receive it, practice it, and live it. And... So, Zechariah chapter 3, Joshua the high priest, and I'm going to point out how Joshua, like Joshua in the book of Joshua, this is a translation of salvation. So, who was able to enter the promised land? Well, there was Joshua and Caleb, the translation of these names being salvation and a dog. So, 
Joshua the high priest here, salvation, the high priest. And who is the intercessor, intercessor the intermediary for the church? Well, it's Jesus, the Christ of God, salvation, the anointing of God. So here is salvation, the high priest. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. The Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Indeed, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments standing before the angel. He spoke and said to those standing before him, I'm going to point out the angel of the Lord and Joshua the high priest. And Satan are there. So there's three people that are being focused on. And... So there's nothing mentioned of the Lord being a fourth character there. So something that which kind of stands out to me here. So he spoke and said to those who were standing before him, remove the filthy garments from him. And again, he said, see, I have taken your iniquity away from you and will clothe you with festal robes. Then I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head, clothed him with garments while the angel of the Lord was standing by. The angel of the Lord admonished Joshua, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, okay, if you walk in my ways and perform my service, so... Looks like he is a fourth character there, so. Hmm. I will also have charge of my courts and grant you free access among these who are standing here. So, now listen, Joshua the high priest, you and your friends who are sitting in front of you, indeed they are men who are a symbol, for behold, I am going to bring my servant the branch. For behold, the stone that I have set before Joshua, on uh, one or seven eyes, behold, I will engrave an inscription on it, declares the Lord of hosts, I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. And that day, declares the Lord of hosts, every one of you will invite his neighbor to sit under his vine, under his fig tree. So, this here, it ties into... Just had it, although stumbling over a detail, which is seen later in the passage, kind of uh, derailed my train of thought here. But it says in the New Testament, we're a royal priesthood and a holy nation, and the church of the firstborn. And these are in the letters of the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Peter, if I remember correctly also. But here... The high priest, part of the high priesthood, just like the uh, in Leviticus chapter 10, where it's the line of Aaron, which is the high priesthood. So, being the church of the firstborn in Christ, we are grafted into him, we're grafted into that true vine, that's the gospel of John chapter 15, and so... This is a picture of what the Lord does with these people, although it's more than that. Second, Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, describes how people are made a new creature in Christ. And it's like with the vision that the Apostle Peter got in the book of Acts, where the Lord lowered a great sheet down, it had all kinds of critters on it. He says, Peter kill and eat. And he said, uh, nothing, I, nothing unclean has ever passed my lips. And then the Lord tells him, what I have declared clean, you don't go and declare unclean. And so, that's what this ties into with what James was saying in his letter. 
It's with our tongues, we bless God, and then we curse men which are made in the image of God. And so this is something that isn't right. And here you have witness at multiple points across the span of Scripture on this. And so this is across Old and New Testaments, this pattern of what the Lord does. So, of course, there's also an example of of why you need to be diligent in your study and kind of go ahead on things with your study before you go and do something online and wind up tripping over yourself on something. But anyway, that's what I saw glancing through it as I was putting these notes together. So, it takes knowing Jesus. So, he is the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes unto the Father but through him. And all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, and those who trust in him will not be disappointed. So, you are a whosoever, you have a pulse, you breathe, you're human, you qualify. So, the wages of sin is death, because everybody falls short of the glory of God, All born onto this side of creation are are under this are under sin, and so that's what has happened. If you my mind's blown here, so before I crash and burn with this thing here. Um, Lord, do a quick work in the in these people's hearts that if they have not received you as Lord and Savior, I pray they will do so now. So all of you who need Jesus, repeat after me. Dear Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. Wash me and cleanse me. Set me free. Jesus, thank you that you died for me. I believe that you are risen from the dead and that you're coming back again for me. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Give me a passion for the lost, a hunger for the things of God and a holy boldness to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm saved, I'm born again, I'm forgiven, and I'm on my way to heaven because I have Jesus in my heart. And so if that was too quick, Romans chapter 10, verses 8 to 13, it's pretty much got the whole, whole thing in there. So I hope that helps you. God bless you.